prayer updates first. Uh, hi, guys. Welcome to Breaking Bread for this week. I had two prayer requests that were sent in to me. Uh, I did actually speak with Ken this week, his voice. Uh, you know, two steps forward, one steps back, but he is making progress. He plans on joining us every other week beginning next week. So I look forward to seeing Ken and again, just continued healing for his voice, not only just for speaking purposes, but also for his singing. And then secondly, Donna, I don't know the nature of this, but it sounds rather extensive. She's having a, a four hour surgery on Friday on her foot. So uh, she has appealed to us to pray for her on her behalf that that surgery would go well and everything will go smoothly with that. So if you guys could remember those two things in your weekly prayers this week, I would greatly appreciate it. Um, for this week, uh, let's see, Paul, do you always have to close your eyes when you pray, or can you sometimes pray with your eyes actually open? <laughs> I many times pray with my eyes open mostly pray with my eyes open and since we haven't done this for five let's have a, a mobile version of opening <laughs> prayer from you sir if you don't mind i would love to father god you are such an awesome god that we get to love thank and to you. serve and and are loved by and so we thank you so much for drawing us into this personal and passionate relationship that we enjoy with you and lord we just ask you to bless our time together we're so thankful for lynn our um beloved leader who's been teaching us for so many years and you've been working through and in, and so we're thankful for that give him your words today lord may they not be his words but your words yeah. and may you give us ears and hearts to listen that we would be um, just ready to soak up your word and to be changed by it so father we put it into practice that your kingdom would come and your will would be done and that we would be part of your plan for this earth and for our lives and for those of our families so bless us all as we seek your face and and help us in our time together. We love you so much. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Do you guys remember yeah. the old Bullwinkle and Rocky show? Yes, of course. Yeah. And they had segments on there called Fractured Fairy Tales. Right. Yeah. Pa Paul just and reminded me that. Boris and Natasha, they always report oh, yeah. to their fearless leader. That's why. They <laughs> Thank you for that. That just gave me a flashback. All right. This is your fearless leader. Um, we are going to be going through the balance of chapter two today, and we're going to attempt to go all the way through Esther, uh, Esther chapter three. So if you guys will go ahead and turn uh, to verse 19 of chapter two. Got two basic lessons, takeaways. You may get obviously like every week as the Holy Spirit leads you. You may derive other things from this than what I've outlined as my two lessons, but that's the wonderful thing about the Holy Spirit and God's word is it speaks differently to all of us. Um, we want to go to verse 19. And just to recap, when we last left off, um, Esther has now been promoted to the role of queen. We had gone through this um, what I believe to be an involuntary beauty pageant. And she was selected and she is now the queen of Persia. Uh, now we're going to enter a third, uh, excuse me, our fourth and final main character we'll get to in just a second. Uh, but first let's find out what the little epilogue to chapter two was. Now, as you Finished chapter two last week. I said there was kind of a break and this kind of fits better with chapter three. So here we go. When virgins were gathered together a second time, Mordecai sat within the king's gate. Now, remember, Mordecai was Esther's older cousin who had raised her as his own child when her parents were killed. Now, Esther had not revealed her family or her people, just as Mordecai had charged her, for Esther obeyed the command of Mordecai as when she was brought up by him. So we talked about this last week. Mordecai had said, hey, don't reveal that you're a Jew. Uh, keep it under wraps for now. Um, and so he, she's continuing on with this instruction. Now, 
a little problem with this first. Uh, scholars are not clear at, or uh, there is no definitive answer on this. Why were the virgins gathered together a second time? We already had this first gathering of which Esther was part of, rumored to be about 400 gals. She was one of the 400 that was picked. The other 399 went off to be with the concubines, um, basically living an imprisoned life for the rest of their lives. Um, one possibility is Hazarus was not limited from having other virgins or from promoting other women to be his queen. Uh, certainly, we look no further than King Solomon of the Jews to see that uh, King Solomon had 700 wives or queens and 300 concubines. So this is not unprecedented. Um, however, I think it's something a little more simple. I think this is a translation error. I don't think this is supposed to be in our text. Again, I'm one of those cats that believes the Bible is 99.9% .9%, uh, perfect the way it exists. That point one is translation errors, small things which do not change the text in any way, shape, or form. The reason I say that is in the ancient Greek Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible in its earliest forms, completely omits that sentence. It's not even in that, it, it's not even in the Septuagint. So more than likely this doesn't belong there. However, the rest of that sentence is still valid. Mordecai sitting within the king's gate uh, and the part about Esther. Now, Mordecai sitting within the king's gate, as we've spoken up about before when we were going through the book of Ruth and talking about Boaz at the city gate, a city gate in uh, ancient Near East cultures was the hubbub of activity. This is where um, uh, rulers would sit, leaders, city leaders. This is where city business was conducted, is where transactions, a lot of business transactions because it was a flow through point. Most of these cities were walled. These ancient cities were walled for their own protection. So you had these natural choke points uh, that were created. And this is where a lot of the city leaders. So from this, we know that Mordecai has been given a position of leadership in, in the city of Shushan, of Susa, the capital, depending on whether you say it in Hebrew or in Persian. Uh, now, again, this thing about Esther not initially saying that she was a Jew, a lot of bad rap about that against her. Uh, she's actually doing what Mordecai has told her to do. Um, it's one of the reasons this book was criticized and many people were reluctant in the Hebrew community to allow this into their canon of scripture. It eventually did make it into their canon of scripture. By the way, just a general quiz. Do you know the, I think this is accurate and, and somebody will fact check me, I'm sure if it isn't. There's one other Old Testament book that also does not mention the name of God. Does anybody know what that one is? I don't see any lips moving. It's Song of Solomon. Huh. I'll Song just say Ecclesiastes, Solomon. but anyway. So, so, however, and again, I'm not getting into numerology and acrostics, but you can see the name Yahweh as the Hebrews would have not pronounced the full name of God, been considered not worthy to do so. It was, it was, um, it was abbreviated Y H W H, or we would say Yahweh. Uh, in acrostics, in the study of acrostics, and again, I'm not going to get too far in the weeds on this. If you look at the initial and final letters of certain words in the book of Esther, Esther 1, 20, 5, 4, 5, 13, 7, 7, to mention a few. In Hebrew, the beginning letter and the end letter always spell out this Yahweh acrostic. Um, now, even in some ancient manuscripts, those letters within those words not only are an acrostic, but they're actually made slightly larger than the rest of the words in, in that sentence. So um, there is thinking that Yahweh was mentioned perhaps in Esther in this veiled sort of way. Um, 
perhaps this was because this was written under Persian rule and for distribution inside the Persian empire. So maybe they wanted to keep it somewhat veiled, somewhat hidden, but I think there's a much more obvious choice. It's the whole reason we said we were going to study this book. It's the whole theme of this book. It's that it shows God's providence and God working behind the scenes, active all the way through the book of Esther. Um, whether he's spelled out in it or not, God is absolutely in control. And I think Esther is a great book to illustrate God's providence. So that's my take on it. Verses 21 and 23 as we continue on with the story. In those days, while Mordecai sat within the king's gate, two of the king's eunuchs, Bigthan and Teresh, who were doorkeepers, became furious and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. So the matter became known to Mordecai. Remember, he's sitting in the city gate. You can kind of picture him overhearing this conversation. Mordecai, who then told Queen Esther, and Esther informed the king in, on behalf or in Mordecai's name. And when an inquiry was made into the matter, it was confirmed, and both Bigthan and Teresh, both were hanged on the gallows. And it was written, this is important because we're going to come back to this later in our story, it was written in the book of the Chronicle, Chronicles in the presence of the king. So this event and who reported and so forth was all recorded for the king to read at a later date. So um, one of the things I wanted to point out here is apathy and Mordecai's lack thereof. Now, this would have been easy, especially after your adopted daughter was just corralled with 399 others forced into a beauty contest, which involves sleeping with the king. And now she is the queen and he's worried about her. Um, it would have been very easy. And I think you can understand not to have warm thoughts about King Ahasuerus. Um, he possibly could have been thinking, I'm a Jewish man. I'm in exile underneath a pagan king. I don't care if he's killed one way or another. Matter of fact, I'd be glad if their plan goes through. But he didn't do that. And for this, I just want to reference, I'm not going to go there, but if you if you write down 1 Peter 2.17, basically, long before Peter, Peter was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write it, uh, Mordecai has the same thought. It's fear God and honor the king, which is what Mordecai is doing. So he reports it. He does what he should do, even though the king is a pagan and even though the king is uh, obviously a not very likable individual, he does the right thing as a citizen and reports this um, assassination attempt. And by the way, this was not unusual in this culture. Uh, assassination attempts were very real. As a matter of fact, in most of these societies, this is how leadership change took effect, sad but true. As a matter of fact, the Hazarus that we're speaking of today, he was eventually killed by a future prime minister who then put Artaxerxes I on the throne, which is the next person that we'll historically see in the line of succession after, um, after this guy. So this did happen. Uh, and so this threat was actual, it was real. Now, again, this is an unfortunate um, New King James translation. I'm not going to say error, but I, I don't agree with the choice of words. It says hung on a gallows, and that is actually not what the original Hebrew says. The gallows were a tree, not like we would picture in the Wild West gallows. And the idea of being hanged on a tree is not with a noose around your neck. So we're bringing some things into this that have biased us due to the 1800s and what that would mean to us. It did not mean that to them at all. A better way of saying this is they were impaled upon a tree. Uh, and the process is described by outside biblical sources. It's rather gruesome, but I'll explain. Actually, Adam Clark, one of the old, old, old time 
scholars and commentators that I occasionally read for these studies. I'll read you what Adam Clark says. It's written in Old English, but here we go. A pointed stake is set upright in the ground. So they would drill a hole, put a pointed stake upright in the ground. In the ground. The culprit is then taken, placed on the sharp end, and then pulled down by his legs till the stake that went in at the, as he calls it, the fundament, passes up through the body and comes out through the neck. It is a most dreadful species of punishment in which revenge and cruelty may glut the utmost of their malice. The culprit lives in considerable time in excruciating agony. So this is how they killed. They didn't do the Roman crucifixion and they didn't hang from the gallows. This is how the Persians would set an example of their um, criminals. Now, as we close out chapter two, I want you to note something. This deed that Mordecai did reported to Esther, Esther reported to the king, the guys were caught, all ended well. Um, notice something, Mordecai was never recognized or rewarded for that act, but it was recorded in the Chronicles of the King. And, and again, we won't get to that in this next chapter, but in a future chapter, that will become a very pivotal point. Let's move on to, to chapter three. You guys still staying with me so far? All right. After these things, what we just talked about, King Ahasuerus promoted, now we get to our fourth main character. He's our fourth and final character. Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes who were with him. So the first thing I need to explain is, although the story is told chronologically, it is not told without gaps in the story. What you don't know is when it says, after these things, between chapter two and this execution and chapter three, which is Haman's promotion, three to four years has transpired. So, and one commentator said it could have been as long as five years trying to do some math. So we'll just say three to five years had transpired between chapters two and three. Now we're gonna talk about Haman. And he is not only our fourth and final character of our play, he is also the villain of our story. And uh, I'm gonna picture the Snidely since we're talking about uh, Boris and Natasha and the fearless leader and Bullwinkle, I'm gonna picture the, the uh, Snidely Whiplash from Dudley Do-Right, if you remember that character. This is this guy, okay? Um, now there's a lot of conjecture who Haman was, who he was related to, what an Agagite really is. Um, I'm gonna go with the best theory, but when I say that, please understand it is just a working theory. They're not 100% sure on the scholar side that this is true, but it's most likely to be true, okay? There's your disclaimer. So going back, if you and don't go there, but if you go all the way back to 1 Samuel 15, you'll read a story about God and he's using King Saul, who is Israel's first king, and they are conquering these different Canaanite areas that are in front of them. And one of these were this group of people called the Amalekites. Now, the Amalekites were uh, a nomadic people who lived in the southern desert region beneath Israel. And they had the dubious and um, evil distinction, they were the very first Canaanite tribe to attack Israel. When they came out of Egypt in the Exodus, the first group that, that got after them were the Amalekites. And ever since then, there was animosity between the Amalekites and the Israelites. Now fast forward. Now we're in the times of King Saul of the Israelites. God through Samuel the prophet goes to King Saul and says, I want you to go wipe out all the Amalekites, everybody. 
And he does only partial obedience with that. I'm not going to go too much into the weeds on that story, but King Saul spares the life of the Amalekite king, whose name was King Agag. Now, this is where most scholars believe this uh, Haman is a descendant of. Uh, instead of identifying them as Amalekites, they identify them as Agagites or from the family line or family tree of Agag. So this not only means this conflict now is set up between Haman and Mordecai. Do you remember when we studied Mordecai's background? We said he was the son of Kish. Well, another son of Kish is Saul, King Saul. So it's not only Israelites versus the Amalekites, it's also the hatred between two families within there. The King Saul, son of Tish, and King Agag, um, and now Haman is his descendant. So you can see this conflict has now been set up in our story. If you want to think of Haman in proper terms, you're going to see this guy is anti-Semitic to the max. And he's only focused on one thing, the extermination of the Jews. So you can kind of think of him as a, as a Hitler of the Old Testament. Um, his position that he's just been awarded. Do you remember we talked about the seven princes and the magicians that would have advised Ahasuerus in chapter one? Well, guess what? This guy trumps them all. He's the second in command, second only to King Ahasuerus in power kind of a prime minister type of a role. All right, verses two and three. I know we're not making very good progress here today. And all the king's servants who were within the king's gates bowed and paid homage to Haman. For so the king had commanded concerning him, concerning Haman. But Mordecai would not bow or pay homage then the king's servants who were within the king's gate said to Mordecai, why do you transgress the king's commands? Now, again, when things aren't sure, I tell you up front, we're not entirely sure why Haman did not bow before, excuse me, why Mordecai did not bow before Haman. Um, Two working theories. The problem is the language in the original Hebrew isn't really clear if when this, this bowing that's spoken of, is it meant to worship Haman as if he's a god, or is it meant to worship, is it meant to bow to him just to show simple respect? Why is that important? Because there were occasions when Hebrews, and not violating any God's commands, would bow before kings or high officials. You can find that in 1 Samuel 4 if you want to look it up. Excuse me, 1 Samuel 24 if you want to look that up. So there were instances where it was perfectly okay for a Jew to bow before somebody else as long as it did not mean worship in place of God. If it just was a sign of respect or of his position, that was fine. We don't know what Mordecai's problem was, but it's not hard to imagine that on any level, Mordecai was not going to bow to this guy. If it was meaning worship, then he couldn't do it as a Jew, which you're going to see in verse four, it kind of hints at that. But also the very fact that Mordecai is from the family of Kish, King Saul, an Israelite, and to fathom that uh, King Saul's relative bowing to King Agag's relative from the Amalekites is just would be uh, inconceivable for him to do that. So no self-respecting Benjamite would ever bow before a descendant of the Amalekite enemy. So either way, we get this situation set up where Mordecai doesn't bow, doesn't show respect or worship, whatever the case may be, to Haman. And other people notice he's not private about it. He is very bold and in your face. So here we go with the stripping back and up to now, keeping everything under wraps. Now we're going to start to see 
uh, their heritage coming out, verses four through six. Now it happened when these guys were speaking to Mordecai daily at the gate and Mord about not bowing and, and Mordecai would not listen to them that they told it to Haman to see whether Mordecai's words would stand. For Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. So now Mordecai says, listen, I can't bow to this guy. Now Mordecai reveals his heritage. I'm a Jew. We're not allowed for whatever reason. Again, we don't know if it's uh, because of this conflict between uh, King Agag and King Saul, or, or could it be because the in the original language, it was implying a worship of a god. But in any case, the cat's out of the bag. Continue on. When Haman saw that Mordecai, first, obviously, Haman didn't notice. But when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay him um, homage, Haman was filled with wrath. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were out the whole, that's important, the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, the people of Mordecai. So now we get to the crux of the matter and now the dilemma of our entire story. Uh, Mordecai has ticked off the wrong guy, second in command, the prime minister, and Haman has it out for the Jews. Now, this does tend to lend credence to both sides of the story that, that, that this guy really was an Amalekite, a descendant, because he had something out in for the Jews. He just, he did not like the Jews at all. Um, when it was interesting that Mordecai's behavior at first didn't even merit the attention of Haman, but it, other people noticed and other people told Haman about it, which infuriated Haman. It says he was filled with wrath. So you can picture this guy, um, super proud, super insecure, the kind of guy that he could only consider him uh, himself a success if everybody else thought that he was a success. He loved his power and his authority. Um, he loved all the reverence, just eating that up, that everybody had to show him. And the Jews, though, of course, they, they would look to God and God alone for that kind of worship and reverence. And so he gets it in his head that anybody who has the potential to disregard his authority, he's going to kill. So I think this goes just beyond this individual offense. I think this goes back, like I said, to an animosity between two people groups, which has been around for hundreds of years. His quest for personal power and, and the hatred of the Jewish race has, has consumed him. So. He has this basic hatred of the Jews. So that's going to bring us to our first lesson, which I'll be able to get through before our time expires. I want to talk to you about the Jewish race, about Israel. Um, for years, our breaking bread, when it met physically in person at Perkins, especially we had one or two guys that were very good about this, they would always pray for Israel, the peace of Jerusalem, We'd always pray for, for the Jewish race. Um, now, I know if any of you know the history of Christianity, um, been very spotty and checkered within the church. The church has not walked a very straight line for many times in its history. And one of the ways that we kind of got ourselves out of kilter is we too blamed the Jews for the death of the Messiah. And so Christians, uh, had this animosity towards Jews because they crucified Jesus. So this is not only horribly mistaken and misplaced, it's horribly biblically inaccurate. Um, God's promises to the Jewish people are still in existence today. Let me repeat that. The promises of God as it applied to the Jewish people are still in place today. 
one of those promises are if you curse the Jew, then you're going to be cursed. Do you remember that one? That's not a conditional statement. It says, if you do this, then this will happen. Not, and that goes away when the Messiah comes and then the church comes and takes the place of the Jews place and blah, blah, blah. I've always been taught and believe this to be the fact that God is not done with the Jewish people. He is not done with Israel. The church is here now. The church has been grafted onto the main branch, but we're not the main branch, guys. We are here as a bookmark, okay, for a time and a season in history, in world history. But God is not done with the Jews yet in the end times and so forth. Uh, dramatic, wonderful, awesome, spectacular things are going to happen with the Jewish people. We need to be cognizant of that. I look at history, and you only have to turn back the pages of history. And it's to me, this is just so remarkable. I, I like the way one of the scholars wrote this. You need only turn back the pages of history to find that the Jews have attended the funeral of every one of the nations and races that have tried to exterminate them. Let the weight of that statement sink into you for a second. Egypt, Babylon, Assyria, Persia, Rome, Germany, in our recent history, World War II, Hitler trying to exterminate every one of the last Jews, convinced he could get rid of them all. Yet today, where is Hitler? He's gone. Where are the Jews? 1948, back in Israel, back in their own land, back in Jerusalem. The fact that they have not been exterminated should be, even to a non-believer, miraculous. The fact that one people group could be so blamed throughout history is miraculous in a negative way and should be a testimony that there is a God and there is something else supernatural that's going on here. God has indeed preserved them. In the providence and design of God, the Jews were the custodians of his written word. The people of the Jewish race were chosen to carry God's word to all humanity, not just themselves. They got that one wrong when they became very introverted and didn't use what God gave them to minister to the people groups of the world. Our very Bible has come through Jews. God jo chose them for that. They transmitted the scripture. Satan hates the Jews because of not only the scriptures that have been translated to us through them, but also because Jesus Christ, our Messiah, was born of them. So one of the quotes that Paul wrote in the New Testament was this, speaking of the Jews, who are the Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises of God, of whom are the fathers, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, the eternally, uh, the eternally blessed God, amen. That's Romans 9, 4 through 5. So guys, God is not done with the Jews. We need to be praying for them, praying for their nation. People would counter, yeah, but they're mostly nationalistic and nobody really, pra it doesn't, it, God's promises were never conditional on this point, guys and gals. We need to be praying for the peace of Israel, for the peace of Jerusalem, for their safety, for their protection. There is this supernatural hatred from Satan towards the Jews, which he will occasionally fan the flames of another people group to go after them. And why? 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 Why this? Why? Why this emphasis on this? And it's simply because of this. Satan wanted to stop the birth of the Messiah coming into the world. Look at how many times he has tried to get the Jews exterminated throughout history. And post-Christ continues, now that Christ has come, continues to be a, a, a bad loser or a bad sport about it 
and wishes to exterminate that entire race of people. And I'll close with this. Israel Zangwill wrote, prejudice is the dislike for all that is unlike. Prejudice is the dislike for all that is unlike. When Haman said the Jews were a different people, he's right because they're the difference between salvation for the world and nothing. Mark Twain said, anti-Semitism is the swollen envy of pygmy minds. From Pharaoh to Hitler, every leader who's ever tried to destroy the Jews has tasted the wrath of God. God's covenant with Abraham still stands. Genesis 12. All right, guys, I will see you back here in about a minute, two minutes, and we will finish up with the rest of chapter three.